one thing that they used to say is Hancock can't be right because there was no global cataclysm, you know, 12 or 13,000 years ago. Well, now we know there was, and there are various explanations for it. Right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. Graham Hancock's interpretation of the Piri race map created in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis, presents a fascinating narrative about the knowledge of ancient civilizations. The map, discovered in 1929 in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey, has only about one-third of its original content preserved. Despite this, the map's detail and coverage, including parts of Europe, North Africa and the Brazilian coast, are noteworthy. The scale of the map is inconsistent, a common feature in early cartography, and it includes various annotations and illustrations. This is a very neglected area of the world uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. Piri Reis himself indicated that the map was compiled using various earlier sources, including charts from Christopher Columbus and possibly older maps, which might have included Western and Eastern, including Arabic navigational charts. Hancock's interpretation of the map primarily focuses on its depiction of the Antarctic coastline. He claims that the map shows the northern coastline of Antarctica in a largely ice-free state, which, according to him, last occurred more than 6,000 years ago. This assertion, if true, would imply a significant historical anomaly, suggesting that ancient seafarers might have charted Antarctica long before it was officially discovered. However, this interpretation is contentious. Critics argue that the so-called Antarctic coast could be a misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the South American coast, or even an imaginative addition, not uncommon in early cartography. In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1880 by our civilization. It incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. Another intriguing aspect of the Piri race map, according to Hancock, is its accuracy in longitude in certain sections. He posits that this level of accuracy indicates a more advanced knowledge of navigation and geography than what was available at the time. However, this claim is debated by scholars who argue that the accuracies could be coincidental or exaggerated since accurate methods for measuring longitude were not developed until the 18th century. Hancock also suggests that the map depicts mountain ranges in Antarctica, which were unknown and under ice until recent times. This, he believes, further points to ancient knowledge of geography. Critics, however, counter that these features could be inaccuracies, such as misdrawn coastlines or symbolic illustrations, rather than representations of actual geographical features. Graham Hancock's hypothesis about advanced ancient knowledge, particularly as seen through the lens of ancient maps like the Piri Rice map, certainly stirs up a conversation about our understanding of historical and archaeological knowledge. Hancock points out that these maps display a level of geographical detail that seems remarkably accurate, especially when you consider the time they were created. For example, the Piri race map, which includes detailed coastlines and island locations, seems to suggest a level of knowledge that surpasses what was known or should have been possible at the time. It's quite intriguing, really. One of the more captivating aspects of Hancock's theory is the suggestion that some of these maps show features that were not officially recognized until much later. Well, this map was drawn in 1813. It's the Pinkerton world map, um, and it's based on the latest science available in 1813. So Antarctica isn't there. Why isn't Antarctica there? Because it's an honest map. They hadn't discovered it in 1813. So it's very odd in my view that Antarctica appears on much older source ma maps, which themselves are based on even older source maps. Um, Take, for instance, his interpretation of the Antarctic coast as depicted on the Piri Race map, a region not known in the 16th century. This leads Hancock to speculate that these maps could have been based on even older sources, possibly from a forgotten civilization that had extensively charted the globe. It's as if he's hinting at a lost chapter in human history.
one that recorded the Earth with surprising accuracy and detail. When we dive into the technological implications of his theory, things get even more interesting. Hancock suggests that the creators of these original source maps must have had advanced navigational skills, including the accurate measurement of longitude. A significant challenge that wasn't resolved until much later with the invention of marine chronometers in the 18th century. The precision in these maps, particularly in terms of latitudinal and longitudinal readings, implies a level of cartographic sophistication that seems out of place in the historical timeline as we understand it. It's as if these mapmakers had tools and knowledge that history says they shouldn't have had. Graham Hancock's ideas about the loss and transmission of ancient knowledge are quite captivating, weaving together a narrative that stretches across time and civilizations. He proposes that a wealth of geographical knowledge, once possessed by an advanced ancient civilization, was largely lost due to cataclysmic events or perhaps the gradual decline of this civilization. It's a, it's a navigational device, it's, uh, it, it, it's a geared, cogged uh, mm. system that allows you to track the passage of time and figure out where you are. Again, that testifies to a lost navigational skill that, yes. we, that we have not taken account of. Before. It's a thought-provoking idea, suggesting that what we know of our past might just be the tip of the iceberg. Hancock believes that some remnants of this knowledge managed to survive and eventually influenced the cartographic work of later civilizations, including those in the medieval and renaissance periods. Hancock delves into how this information could have been passed down. He suggests a variety of channels, including oral traditions, mythological texts, and even surviving cartographic materials, which later mapmakers like Piri Rees might have used. Imagine, for a moment, ancient mariners passing down stories of distant lands and seas, with these tales eventually finding their way into the maps and charts of later generations. One of the more intriguing aspects of Hancock's hypothesis is his connection with myths and legends from different cultures around the world. He often draws parallels between these stories and the idea of advanced prehistoric knowledge and global cataclysms, such as the Great Flood narratives found in many cultures, in Hancock's view, these myths and legends aren't just fanciful stories, they're potential historical records, allegorical but based on real events and knowledge from these lost civilizations. It's a narrative that challenges us to think beyond conventional historical accounts, suggesting that our ancestors might have known far more about the world than we give them credit for. You see, the, the, the one thing there's no dispute about anymore uh, is that the Younger Dryas was a cataclysm. The, 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 the megafauna that, uh, that, that die off, the disruption of human activity that takes place at that time, the huge climate changes, this was a cataclysm by any standards. Where the argument still goes on is what caused the, what caused the cataclysm. Graham Hancock has this really interesting, if somewhat controversial, hypothesis about a global cataclysm that he believes occurred around 10,600 BCE. He suggests that Earth was hit by a comet or a series of comet impacts at this time, leading to massive environmental and climatic upheavals worldwide. This idea is particularly interesting because he links it to the Younger Dryas period, a well-documented era of abrupt climate change that started around 12,900 years ago and lasted for about 1,300 years. The Younger Dryas is known for a sudden shift back to colder and drier conditions following a period of warming after the last ice age. Hancock posits that this comet impact could have been the trigger for this dramatic climatic shift. What's intriguing is how Hancock uses ice core samples from Greenland and Antarctica to support his theory. These ice cores, which provide a detailed record of past temperatures and atmospheric compositions, show evidence of a rapid climatic change during the Younger Dryas. He sees this as a smoking gun, indicating a major impact event. He also points to geological evidence like sediment layers that show signs of sudden environmental changes, further supporting his comet impact theory. We see all the megafauna dying off suddenly and rapidly. We see rises in sea level. We see a huge collapse in, in global temperature. What is becoming clearer and, and clearer uh, is that the evidence that a comet behind it was behind it is, is extremely strong. But Hancock doesn't stop there. He goes on to suggest that this hypothesized comet impact had profound effects on both flora and fauna, including contributing to the extinction of many large mammal species during what's known as the Pleistocene megafauna extinction. The changes in vegetation and ecosystems, he argues, would have had cascading effects on wildlife and human populations alike. 
For human societies, Hancock believes this event was catastrophic, causing significant disruptions and leading to the loss of advanced knowledge and cultural practices of prehistoric civilizations. It's like he's suggesting a kind of cultural amnesia, where societies forgot the advancements they had made. And then there's this fascinating idea that survivors of this cataclysm might have passed on fragments of their advanced knowledge to other cultures, influencing the development of future civilizations. It's a narrative that makes you wonder about the connections between ancient civilizations and how knowledge could have been transferred across generations and geographies in ways we might not fully understand.